time for another video and a quick shout out and big thank you to those of you who've subscribed so far. It's great to have you here following along and it's nice to see other people who are passionate about developing themselves efficiently to get better at painting and drawing. If you're new here, that's what I'm trying to do across a 10,000 hour time frame. And today we're going to talk about the skills we need to enhance within the 10K. I call these skill pillars. So what are skill pillars? These are the fundamental skills required to be good at painting and drawing. And note that I say painting and drawing and not to be an artist or to be a designer or to be an illustrator. Because much like in sport, there are certain skills in art that help out some professions much more than they help out others. And we aren't so concerned with those. Now before you watch this video, I just want to preload your minds with some concepts that should help you understand my approach to painting and drawing. The first is simplification. That means I want to find as few things to study as possible. The second is grouping. That means I want to combine these few things into a compact tight group of related items to make them even simpler. And the third is efficiency, which means I want to find which things give us the best return for the least amount of effort. And that ought to get us to where we want to be as fast and efficiently as possible. As mentioned in my previous video, the high level mastery of throwing a baseball hard and fast only applies to people who want to play baseball. But flexibility and hand-eye coordination are needed for every sport. In the same sense, you don't need to understand the ins and outs of oil paint if you only ever want to work with watercolour, but you will need to understand how colour works regardless of what you choose to paint with. And that's what I'm talking about here. The broadest skills that all artists need trimmed down to their simplest possible form. The complexity of learning to draw and paint is one of those annoying stumbling blocks that you might experience as a beginner. There is a lot to learn, and the skills needed also seem to depend on what specific field of art you want to end up in. For example, traditional artists like Monet or Richard Smith can capture what's in front of them with an astonishing degree of accuracy, yet add their own flair to it. And this seems like something we need to be able to do, but wait! There are designers, people like Scott Robertson or Sid Mead, and these guys don't seem to worry so much about accurately capturing what's in front of them because they can draw and paint things that don't even exist yet, from their heads, from their imaginations. That seems like a totally different skill set. So which one do we practice? Whenever you find yourself trying to learn something, and in a situation like this, you want to stop for a second and try and find all the things that these people have in common. What do they all practice? That's what we're going to focus on. Now clearly there are people who are just really good at specific things, like those baseball players. You do need to be very good at just drawing cars in order to become a car designer. But I'm going to ignore this fact for now, like ignoring the baseball players, and focus on the much broader and useful skills that we need to train. And that's because I think the more specific skills that we see in places like car design are dependent on mastery of the general simpler skills. Long distance runners and sprinters all had to learn to walk before they could run. Grouping. Remember, we're keeping things simple. We want as few things to study as possible and we want to group them. If we were trying to get into shape and build muscle, we don't care about the difference between push-ups or shoulder presses or squats. We can just call that pushing in general. This gives us a simplified group of related, tangible, practicable movements that we can perform diligently and watch ourselves grow stronger. And that's the cool thing about grouping. It means that our simple skills become interrelated, which means that when we train one, we actually train others, much like muscle groups. Sure, we're going to pick one to emphasize, but in reality, whenever you train one skill, you're training multiple skills at once. And I believe that this concept is absolutely key to developing at the fastest and most efficient pace possible. Now, when I came up with this training method, I tried to consider something called the Pareto Principle, or the 80-20 rule. This is a principle coined by Italian polymath and mathematician Wilfredo Pareto, who noticed that 80% of the peas he grew in his garden came from only 20% of his pea plants. And this approximate ratio is actually seen all over the place, both in nature and in human activity. For example, roughly 20% of words in a language can be used to say 80% of the things you would say in everyday conversation. That means if you can master the most common 20% of Spanish words and grammar, you'll be able to say 80% of the things you could ever want to say in Spanish. It's been applied to gourmet cooking, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, even ballroom dancing, and the results are actually pretty nuts. Tim Ferriss uses the Pareto Principle in learning new skills, where he basically states that you need to figure out and get good at the core 20% of stuff that will allow you to do 80% of the activity. That means we don't want to train fluffy, marginally related, painty, drawy things. We want the core, laser-focused activities that will lead to fast and direct improvement. If we can learn the 20% of skill that makes us good at drawing and painting, then we should be able to draw 80% of the things we could ever want to draw and paint, even from our imagination, even with no reference. 
Now, we'll get to that key 20% when I return to the Pareto Principle another time. Um, but for now, I just want you to bear that in mind and understand that I frame the skill pillars within that context. I've settled on five skill pillars for the purposes of our studies, and I want you to remember that when we work any drill, we're working more than one skill pillar. Sometimes we're working all of them, but we are usually going to pick one to emphasize. Let's start with the simplest, which is composition. Composition includes all the stuff like the rule of thirds, how to convey emotion with our viewpoint, how to use light and shadow shapes to guide the eye across a canvas, and where to place a character in a scene. Everyone who draws or paints needs to know at least a little bit about composition because they're going to be working within a space. It might be a canvas, or a screen, or even a post-it note, and so we have to understand a little bit about how to position the subject in order to make it appealing. Storyboard artists use this pillar to convey specific emotions. A designer might choose to use a 30-60 perspective grid instead of an 80-10 one to portray a sports car because it provides the best viewpoint to understand the design from. A landscape artist will see the vista before them as a collection of shapes and values and arrange those on the canvas in such a way as to guide the eye through it. So this is something that we all need to be a bit proficient in. I have a few resources I like that I'm going to be using for drilling this pillar. The first is Framed Ink by Marcus Mateo Mestre. I also like the landscape books by Mitchell Arbala, so I'm going to use those to sort of form a curriculum that we're going to use to study from. Next up is Value. Value allows us to make things seem realistic and solid in space, and it enables us to understand what light is and how it works, which is vital, because it's how we see the world around us. Now, I'm going to say that again, because it's very important. Value is essential because it is how we see the world. It is how our brains interpret information visually. Despite us being able to draw objects with outlines, in reality, outlines don't exist. Just changes in light and dark, changes in value. Even colours are all represented as values, which becomes apparent if you desaturate a photo to view it in black and white. By understanding value, a painter can describe form, which we'll get to in a bit, and make an object seem real. Understanding this gives us a great deal of control in how our viewers understand our subjects. A portrait artist can push some parts of a subject back into space and emphasise others by pushing or pulling the values. A skilled pencil artist can use graphite to make light and dark shapes in two dimensions that our brain thinks exist in three dimensions. They can actually trick us into thinking this image is jumping out of the page. My favourite book on the subject of values is How to Render by Scott Robertson. So I'm going to be working from that to draw this pillar and to try and internalise what it teaches. But I also like those landscape books by Mitchell Arbala that I just mentioned because there's some really good stuff in there. Okay, let's crank this up a notch. It's going to get a little bit harder now. The third pillar is colour. Now, this includes the infinite amount of colours that we could deploy in a painting, but also things like colour harmonies, more on light, as well as things like human psychology and cultural awareness. This is the thing that most beginners screw up on, myself included, and it's because we have to understand value before we can really appreciate what colour actually is. This is something I really want to work on during the 10k, but before I jump into colour, I do want to spend a lot of time just getting good at values first. Colours can be as simple as branding choices and as complex as manipulating human emotion and psychology. For example, cinematographers and colour key artists use colour to make us feel a certain way at certain points in a movie. Colour is also very subjective. That means if we get three landscape painters to all paint the same scene, their colour choices will be varied, and that's because different people see colours very differently and they pick different things to emphasise when using colour in their work. Colour harmonies and schemes you may have seen before are systems that we can use as shortcuts to make our work appealing and pleasing to the human brain. They represent an easy to manage method of learning how to manipulate colour, so we're going to be drilling those. The best resource I've found for learning this is Colour and Light by James Gurney, but I also have a book with the same name published by 3D Total, so we're going to be using those. Okay, time for the big one, form and perspective. This one does actually overlap with value technically once we start painting, but we're going to be thinking more simply here, and so really what we're talking about when we say form is whether we can make something look believable and 3D using just lines. That's it. Technically, it does include things like the study of anatomy and the developing of a visual library, and we might want to include things in here like rhythm or gesture, but we don't want to worry about those for now because they're more specific. Remember, we're thinking simply. So can we make it believable and can we make it 3D with just lines? This pillar is the ability for a sketch artist to make a scene feel deep with no value and no colour. Like when Kim Jong-gi draws a cool picture with a ballpoint pen, this pillar is like 90% of how he's doing that. Now remember that grouping keyword I mentioned earlier, how everything's interrelated? Well, no matter if you're working your composition, your value or your colour, you are always working your form. It's super important. But that's okay, because every drill we'll do will be working this pillar. That means we're going to get very, very good at it within the 10k. The best book I've found on form is How to Draw by Scott Robertson, so I'm going to be working from that. 
I have a few other books like Frame Perspective by Matteo Mestre and there are some classics by authors like Francis Ching, but honestly most books on the subject of form and perspective just say the same information in slightly different ways. I have some other really good books on learning things like anatomy that are going to fall under this pillar but we're not going to worry about those for now. Are you still with me so far? We have one more pillar and this one is slightly separate from the others but once again no matter what we do we will always be working this pillar and that is technical ability with tools. This pillar is once again very broad and it contradicts slightly what I said before because some of what is inside this pillar might not actually be relevant to you. It includes all the possible tools you can use to make art. That means if you're an oil painter, I want you to think of this pillar as all of your oil paints, all of your brushes, your canvas or boards or whatever you work on. If you want to try your hand at oil paints, watercolours, digital painting and also be good at marker rendering, then this pillar represents those tools. The fact is, whatever tools you use, you need to get very good with them drawing with a brush pen or painting with a gouache set and every time you change the surface or the brand of paint or the brush or even the environment that you're painting or drawing in you have new variables to contend with and to learn from. The mastery of this pillar we treat as separate to any of the other pillars, getting good with your tools. Now I don't have many books on this pillar although there are some that are very highly rated like the Oil Painters Bible by Marilyn Scott I feel the best way to get better is actually to just freely experiment, but I have read Rediscovering Gouache by Alois Blau, and that's very good, I'd recommend it. Also the Scott Robertson books emphasise the need to find good combinations of paper and mark making tools, so we're going to use some of the things that they suggest. You could also include under this pillar competent use of any softwares you like, so things like Photoshop or Procreate, how to make them do the things you want them to do, how to use the shortcuts, make brushes, adjustment layers, stuff like that. And that's about it. Remember the most important thing is that you think as simply as possible. Forget anatomy, forget perspective, just call it form. Forget about the Zorn palette and triadic colour schemes, just call it colour, at least for now. So to recap, we've just thought about, in very simple terms, what painting and drawing actually are, regardless of whether you want to be a comic book artist or a car designer. In order for us to progress as fast as possible, within a 10,000 hour time frame, we need to master those five pillars in combination. We're going to do that through two things understanding and drilling. Now I'll share my method for attacking this soon but before that in order for this experiment to work and be valid we need to establish a baseline. So join me next time where I'll share some previous work examples and discuss a little more about goal setting. I hope you can join me then.